Hello, and welcome to day two of the Greenlight Guru True Quality Virtual Summit, the three-day event designed to provide actionable takeaways you can implement in your own company to innovate faster, stay ahead of regulatory changes, and use quality as a strategic asset to grow your device business. This session is on strategies for ensuring a medical device released under EUA will stay on the market after EUA expires. So big topic, really time sensitive topic here. Uh, my name is Taylor Brown and I am a med device guru here at Greenlight Guru and I will be your moderator for today's event. We have a really special session scheduled for you today. I know our speakers, Brad Graves and Kathy Wilburn, are really looking forward to covering what activities companies need to be doing now to prepare and submit their device for approval through non-EUA regulatory pathways to ensure their device can remain on the market after EUA approval expires. Now, before we dive too deep in today's presentation, I will introduce our speakers and their company, R&D Group. Uh, I'm gonna touch on a few items really quick. First of all, this session is going to run for about 45 minutes in total and will include a Q&A at the end where Brad and Kathy have been ex kind enough to answer your questions. Um, so I encourage you to submit your questions throughout this presentation as they may come up in the box on the right hand side of your screen and we will get to as many of them as time permits. Uh, this session will be recorded, don't worry. Once this session wraps up, there is a 10 minute break uh, before the next live session begins. So if you're interested in learning about navigating the one year EUMGR extension, another big topic, you'll want to be sure you're registered for the next session and use your unique link to turn in. Tune in. If you aren't already signed up, you can register for the next session and over 20 others at virtualsummit.greenlight.guru. I'd also like to share a few words about Greenlight Guru and why we put on this free virtual summit. If you've been in one of our training sessions before, then you know we put these on because improving the quality of life is our mission here at Greenlight Guru, likely a similar mission as many of you at today's summit. Anything we can do as an organization that helps device makers bring safer, life-changing devices to market quicker and with less risk aligns with that mission. We're constantly looking for ways to fulfill that mission, whether that's through hosting free events and training sessions, through partnering with world-class medical device consultants, or through our award-winning medical device QMS software. If you'd like to learn more about why medical device companies from across the globe are moving away from paper-based general purpose QMS and adopting our purpose-built medical device quality management software, I encourage you to head on over to www.greenlight.guru after today's presentation to schedule your personalized free one-on-one -on -one demo. Now, on to the bulk of today's presentation, let me give a proper introduction to today's speakers. Uh, we have Brad Graves, is a principal and project leader at R&D Group, the industry leader for medical device software development and regulatory consulting. He has over 30 years of experience in various software development and consulting roles. He has worked in healthcare software for the past 15 years and the last 10 spent with R&D Group managing medical device software development projects. Brad performs multiple roles at R&D Group, including project management, regulatory consulting, technology consulting, and sales and marketing. He is joined by Kathy Wilburn, Director of Quality Assurance and Compliance at R&D Group. Kathy has over 20 years of experience in software engineering and management. In her role at R&D Group, Kathy is focused on keeping R&D's QMS up to date with current revisions of FDA's QSR and guidance documents as well as international standards such as ISO 13485, 14971, and IEC 62304. Kathy also audits client management systems in, to assess their adherence to relevant regulations and standards and provides her expertise in establishing and updating missing and non-compliant procedures and templates. So without further ado, let me hand it over to your presenters, Brad Graves and Kathy Wilburn. Uh, thank you, Taylor. This is Brad Graves. I am going to present the first part of our presentation today, and then Kathy will take the remainder of it. Uh, the agenda that I'm showing here, we're going to give you a brief R&D group overview, talk about what emergency youth author authorization is, uh, discuss the differences between EUA and other pre-market submissions, 
look at some considerations and history of transitioning from pre-market to other types of submissions, and then talk about strategies for preparing a pre-market submission uh, from an EUA. So the R&D group, and I, I won't spend much time on this, but a little commercial on the R&D group. Uh, we are a medical device software development firm. We've been in business for 22 years. Uh, we have 40 full-time engineers. 65% uh, of those roughly are software engineers and 35% are verification engineers. We provide a variety of services, uh, not just software development, but regulatory consulting. Uh, we do a lot of gap assessments, uh, looking against some of the standards based on a customer's uh, existing QMS or design history files that they've created. And importantly, we've been involved with uh, 50 medical devices that have been approved for use by the FDA. Those are our customer projects that we've been involved with throughout the years. So let's start off with what is emergency use authorization? It's basically a, a health and human services capability to declare a health emergency. And once that health emergency is declared, the FDA can authorize use of unapproved medical products or unapproved uses of existing approved medical products uh, to treat a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear health threat. Uh, any types of devices or treatments can be approved through emergency use, um, and it will go through the details of uh, the differences between that and, and other types of uh, authorizations. Here are rough, or here are the last six EUAs that have been uh, enacted by the FDA through health emergencies. Uh, all these are currently active emergency use authorizations, meaning they're still open. There's still devices available approved through EUA for treating these uh, these health emergencies. These all happen to be viruses. Uh, so on the right is the most recent COVID-19. But if you move to the left, you see some that go back uh, further in time, back to 2013 uh, with influenza H7 N9. There have been uh, some emergency youth author authorizations that have been terminated. And here's an example of one. Swine influenza A, also known as 2009 H1N1, uh, was declared a public health emergency in April 2009. It went through several uh, renewals through the FDA and a renewal is basically had the, uh, a, I guess, condition or a situation where the FDA looks at uh, health data and effective and treatment data, device data, and determines whether the health emergency still exists. And if it does, they'll renew the, the declaration. Or in this case, in June of 2010, after four renewals, they decided to terminate the EUA. And at the time of termination, 18 organizations that had devices approved for EUA use were notified that they had to remove their devices from the market. So this, this is pointing out the fact that EUA is definitely a temporary authorization to use a medical device. If we take a look at the current uh, pandemic situation that we're in, there have been 134 devices, medical devices approved for COVID-19 detection or treatment. Uh, over half of those are in vitro diagnostic devices, IVD products, uh, but there are some other types of uh, devices that have been approved, such as laboratory developed tests, personal protective equipment, ventilators, and therapeutic, excuse me, therapeutics. Uh, therapeutic is a, a drug treatment. So now that we've got a little bit of background in uh, what is the emergency youth authorization approval pathway, uh, we'll look at some of the differences between the submission requirements for EUA and other pa submission pathways. So this slide is comparing um, EUA to de novo or and 510K. Uh, I'm not gonna look at PMA because historically all the EUA uh, authorizations have ultimately ended up being uh, class one or class two, I guess mostly class two medical devices. So 
So de novo and 510 are the approval pathways that would be appropriate, assuming that COVID or any generic EUA is going to be a class two device. So if we look at special circumstances required um, for using this approval pathway, there's no special circumstances for de novo or 510K, but there is special circumstances for EUA, the, the, the declaration by HHS of a health emergency needs to exist for EUA to be enacted. In terms of duration, EUA is temporary by until the health emergency is uh, over. De novo and 510K do not have any duration limits. Analytical evaluation, this is basically looking at the specifications, user needs, um, and making sure the product meets the specifications. There's limited analysis done for EUA submissions. There's full validation required for de novo and 510K. Uh, similarly, clinical evaluation, and we'll look at a slide here in a second that goes into detail on clinical evaluation. There's limited um, assessment of clinical evaluation data, and there's full validation required for de novo, de novo and 510K. And then finally, uh, current good manufacturing practices, CGMP, uh, the uh, IVD or medical device vendors are expected to have procedures in place and evidence of following procedures for current good uh, manufacturing practices, but they are not scrutinized um, in detail for an EUA submission, but they are looked at very closely for de novo and 510K submissions. Looking at a little more detail on current good manufacturing practice requirements, this gives you a sense in the right and the left hand column, excuse me, uh, for what needs to be documented in terms of procedures and evidence of following procedures for the device under development, uh, all the design uh, definition and verification validation. And then the right column shows the supporting systems that need to have procedures in place and evidence of following those procedures, such as purchasing and uh, non-conformance and com handling complaints and servicing the product. So this is uh, an entire section in uh, 21 CFR Part 820 that covers quality system uh, expectations for submissions. This is a slide that drills into more detail on uh, clinical evaluation of a submission. I know that there's a lot of information here, but if you focus on the right two columns, it talks about what's required for an EUA submission versus what's required for a de novo or 510K submission. There are, uh, and this specifically is re uh, describing the types of clinical evaluation, clinical testing that's required for a nucleic acid amplification test, which is a type of molecular test using PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And this is the type of technology that's used for all the COVID detection tests uh, that have been submitted to EUA today or to date. Uh, so limit of detection that's required for EUA submission. That basically just defines the minimum concentration of a virus that your test can detect. Inclusivity is required, um, but you can use in silico, which is either manufactured DNA or RNA, or even data generation of DNA, RNA right, to prove your test can detect um, the COVID strain and related strains. Uh, cross reactivity, there's some limited amount of uh, information that needs to be submitted for EUA. And this is basically saying that your test does not uh, show a false positive if some other virus is present, say Zika was present, but not COVID. Your test shouldn't uh, show a positive for, for COVID in that case. Interference is really kind of device specific, and that is uh, interference is related to if a different sample collection method or different reagents are used, do the handling of those um, cause any impact on the test result? Precision is a measure of how predictable, how reliable the test is. And this is usually compared to a, a gold standard, uh, a reference test for 
EUA, there's really no reference established yet. So this test, this type of clinical testing is not required for submission. Uh, it is, and multi-site data is required for de novo 510K submission. Uh, status of the sample, fresh versus frozen. It, there's flexibility for EUA. There's also a little flexibility with de novo 510K, but fresh specimens are definitely preferred. And then finally, clinical evaluation. Uh, it's full validation with a minimum of three sites is required for de novo 510K. Um, some limited testing is, is required for EUA submission. Uh, the, the letter that you receive from the FDA, the, the guidance letter on how to submit your application for EUA uh, talks about three positive, 30 positive samples and 30 negative samples as the minimum clinical evaluation that should be performed. So a much um, less stringent requirement, but at least uh, enough rigor around the clinical submission for EUA that the test can be shown to be effective in detecting the condition uh, COVID-19 in this particular example we're talking about. So now we'll, we'll look at some considerations and some historical uh, information about uh, pre-market submission, transitioning to a pre-market submission from an EUA submission. This slide shows statistics for the past five e EUA um, situations. And it's broken into three parts. The top line uh, shows that for these past five uh, EUA conditions, that there have been 39 total IVD devices submitted uh, and authorized under EUA. And then the middle, the middle row shows that uh, 18 of 18 times the FDA reauthorized the health emergency situation. And there were 61 amendments to devices. So that 61 relates to the number 39 above. So uh, some of the 39 devices probably had zero amendments, others had multiple amendments. So there were a total of 61 amendments to those 39 original devices. But to me, the most interesting statistic of all is the last row, and it, that shows that only six out of the 39 transitioned from EUA approval status to uh, market clearance through either de novo or 510k. So that's roughly 15% of the devices that uh, originally were submitted under EUA achieved uh, market clearance with a permanent status. Pardon me for one second. This slide um, looks at a case study. It uh, looks at a specific device detects, to, detects the Zika virus, and it compares the, the time uh, it took to achieve full market clearance. Uh, so you can see the top timeline uh, shows the EUA submission. So back in March of 2016, pre-submission work was done. And then um, an initial EUA submission occurred, it was authorized, and two amendments were uh, submitted for the device. So from our, roughly a year and a couple of months uh, passed between pre-submission and the final EUA device that was approved for use. In parallel to that, the bottom row shows that uh, it, it was roughly three years of effort from the EUA, EUA uh, health emergency declaration to the time that a uh, clear device was approved under de novo. So there was uh, active work going on for the, in this company's case to pursue a full market approval. In addition to their EUA, uh, they did receive BARDA support to get this device uh, cleared and they were active in communication with the FDA, FDA throughout the whole process, letting them know that their uh, intention was to seek full market approval for this device. So two years delay between the time the EUA was, the final EUA amendment was approved till full market clearance, and then three years of total effort to get the full market approval for this device. So, 
my, myself and hopefully some of you are wondering what why are there so few transitions to to permanent market status um as, as i showed a couple slides ago there were six um six uh, six devices out of 39 uh, achieved full market clearance uh, i to me it comes down to business factors and this this is my interpretation you have to talk to individual companies to uh, get their specific reasons but I believe it's business reasons that uh, cause these companies to determine whether to achieve or whether to pursue uh, full market clearance for the device. So it comes down to time investment. We saw in the previous slide, roughly three years to uh, achieve full market clearance, cost investment, roughly $24 million is spent on average seeking a 510K. Uh, a company has to decide if the health emergency is a permanent situation or just a short-term phenomenon. Uh, will the will the will the virus go away magically? Probably not in the COVID-19 case. And then you have to determine whether e your EUA device is competitive in the market. Uh, is the investment you're going to make to seek full market approval worth? Uh, or is the return you're going to get for full market approval worth the investment that you're going to have to put in to achieve that. Okay, those were the slides I was going to cover, and I'm gonna transition now to Kathy Wilburn to cover the strategies. Kathy? It's Kathy there. We have a, uh, I know we've had some internet outage issues today. Maybe Kathy is uh, offline at the moment. Um, Brad, I see her on and she just went red, so. Okay, well, I will forge ahead without her then. So there are four strategies we're going to look at in terms of um, achieving full market clearance for your device when uh, going from an EUA uh, authorization. Uh, the first is pre-submission meetings and, uh, coupled with active communication with the FDA. Another strategy is to leverage uh, emergency use authorization clinical data, if possible, performing a gap analysis and an audit of... Oh, Kathy, are you there? Yes, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I was just going through the strategies. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming for me. <laughs> all right, I'll finish the strategies and let you take over. So in the, and the for, final strategy is leveraging uh, government organizations such as the Bar, such as BARDA and the CDC for funding and clinical study help. So with that, I'll let Kathy go through the details of each strategy. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Sorry, everyone, We're, we have connection issues in our area, so. Um, had some difficulties there, but should be good now. So like Brad said, he covered in um, in the slides before, he introduced um, you to what the EUA is and um, ideas for whether or not you want to pursue it and gave you some history and some facts of um, previous EUA periods and what that looks like. So really when you, when you submit your EUA, you likely had a goal um, to pursue a pre-market approval or clearance. And so now what we're gonna talk about, like Brad said, is we're gonna go over strategies that you need to consider and also strategies that you can leverage um, during the EUA period that will help you get your um, device um, to market. So the first one is pre-market submissions. And there was a talk yesterday, I'm not sure if, if anyone caught it, but Isabella Schmidt did a talk yesterday all about pre-market submissions. So I recommend going back and watching um, the replay of that and it, it'll cover everything you need to know about that. But the idea with the pre-market or pre-submission, sorry, I think I said the wrong word, pre-submission is that you get early feedback on your submission materials. So it gives you an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with the FDA and go over your strategies and your plan um, before you actually do the submission and also before you go down a path that may not be the best path. 
So you can get early feedback on your regulatory pathway, strategies that you have for testing, for verification, validation, and also um, a really important one is your clinical trials and clinical studies, um, you know, how you're going to accomplish that. Those are all really good topics for your um, pre-submission um, with the FDA. There's no cost, direct cost um, from the FDA for this activity, but you may incur costs if you um, hire a consultant to help you. And um, a lot of people do that, that to help them navigate so they can get the most out of that um, pre-submission activity. Another strategy that you're likely to employ is to leverage your EU clinical data. So you have, the, you have your um, EUA device um, out there and it's being used. And so you need to figure out a plan for, figure out what you need when you do a pre-market submission and then what you have available to you during the EUA period and then what you need and then figure out the differences and how you can um, achieve those during that period. And we have some things here that, um, that'll be fairly easy for you to gather um, some clinical data uh, related to limit of detection, cross reactivity and interference. Those will not be too hard for you to get during the EUA period, um, unless your medical device has undergone changes during that since you received the authorization. But even if it has, you can do a risk assessment and you can determine to what extent those changes affect that data and the performance of your assay. And then there's might be other data that you need to gather um, after or not, not after or maybe you know, during the period um, related to specificity and sensitivity. And again, I recommend um, talking to the FDA through your pre-submissions, uh, pre-submission period or meetings, however you decide that you wanna do that and um, talk to them about your um, clinical data or your plan. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is um, a gap analysis. So Brad went over, um, what the differences were in the requirements for what you needed when you submitted in, um, your device under EUA, and then what you're going to need for a pre-market submission. So again, you're gonna wanna do some sort of gap analysis and figure out what you have and then what you need and what you're going, what activities and what evidence you're gonna need to collect um, to bridge the gap and remediate those gaps. And we've listed here some of the relevant um, regulations and standards. Brad talked about um, CGMP, um, part of it, is, which is um, 21 CFR Part 820. And then also you're gonna wanna look at ISO 13485 and ISO 14971 for risk. And then if your uh, medical device contains software, you're gonna wanna look at IEC 62304 as well. And then other guidance documents and regulations um, put out by the FDA, like HIPAA, and then the um, guidance document for cybersecurity, too. And then the final strategy is to leverage organizations like BARDA and the CDC. So not only can you use them for funding, but you can also um, look to them to talk to, talk to them about strategies for um, sourcing your samples and, um, and determining, helping you with site collection and, and other things like that. So the takeaways from this are that the EUA, it could last for a while. You saw on Brad's slides earlier, that we're, you know, those are still, those devices are still on the market, some of those, but ultimately it is a temporary authorization and your goal should be to pursue a pre, some sort of pre-market um, submission or clearance. And we've given some strategies for that and there's no shortcuts to doing it, but I think the key is to leverage what you've done already to get the EUA 
Um, and then what can you do, do during this period, um, especially with, with, um, with being related to data collection and those sorts of things. And getting your plan in place and start taking actions now in parallel to the use under the EUA. And I think with that, we're ready for questions. Absolutely, Brad, Kathy, thank you both so much for the presentation. Um, audience members, if you'd like to submit a question, be, please feel free to do so over on the right panel. Uh, Brad, I have a question for you. So I really enjoyed reading about all the you know, history of EUA and there's been quite a few over the last couple of years. I would have to think there are some pretty big lessons learned from your perspective of things that people may have done the last time that we can, you know, now having more knowledge behind us, advise the listeners today um, to, to get a head start on. Is there anything that comes to mind as far as lessons learned? Uh, lessons learned from the perspective of the medical device company and how, how to go about their EEO submission? Mm -hmm. Would have, should have, um, could have. <laughs> I, well, the one thing I found in uh, re researching the material for this presentation was the, the FDA has um, published a, a lot of guidance material on their website. The, the, there's a specific uh, Word document that for IVD manufacturers on how to, well, exactly what clinical data needs to be submitted. And that's where some of the details came from for one of the slides I showed. So uh, the main point is to, you know, engage with the FDA if a lot of materials on their website already, and you can you can email them. They have a, a regular email address dedicated to EUA submissions. So I actually emailed them and got this Word document back in reply, which spelled out exactly what information needed to be included in the clinical submission. They covered a little bit about the analytical requirements as well. Um, so that that's the main thing I could I could answer with is uh, you know engage with the FDA uh, take advantage of their their public resources on the website certainly um, contact them through email or phone call and uh, they they seem very responsive even just replying to the email I sent in I got a response in you know half an hour or less so I was really really excited and pleased about that. Good. Yeah, just just don't be afraid of the FDA. Correct. <laughs> good, good advice in general. Um, we have a question. Has the FDA allowed any devices approved through an EUA to remain on the market if they have a normal submission, 510K, de novo, submitted, but not yet cleared or approved, such as enforcement discretion? Uh, the the one, the case study that I presented, which talked about a Zika detection, Zika virus detection device, um, they, the FDA allowed the EUA device to stay on the market until this, the very day that the uh, de novo uh, device was cleared for use. So uh, I think, you know, open communication with the FDA and coordination with them, if they know your intent is to have a uh, full market clearance for your device that they will make sure that you have consistency and, and continued use of your device. I, I know that in that case study background material that I reviewed that the, there was some uh, advance notice that the, the IVD manufacturer had to give to their customers to make sure that protocols for using the approved device were in place so that, you know, uh, one day they stopped using the EUA approved device and then used the de novo approved device that they had to make sure that the protocols were updated and the validations were in place to switch devices. They're essentially the same result was produced by the devices, but it was a, it was considered a, a new um, device from FDA perspective. So they had to coordinate the validation and um, hand, uh, switch over, but the FDA didn't, did not, have any period where the device was, there was not a device from that company that, that was not available. Got it. Got it. Um, another question. Um, can EUA PMS data be used for different intended use pre market submission? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't have enough expertise in actual 
Um, oh, that's post. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I could answer that, Brad. I don't know about you. I I don't have an answer for that either. I'm sorry. And so what we'll do is we'll follow up after the presentation. Okay. Um, and and Brad, I'll quiz you here. Any chance you know that FDA email address off the top of your head, <laughs> or where I people did, can I, go to find it? I did, I can tell you where to go to find it. I I don't have it bookmarked. I just type in uh, FDA EUA or emergency use authorization, sure. and, and uh, that takes you to a web page that shows all the devices, all the EUAs, all the approved, all the authorized devices for all the open EUAs, and uh, if you scroll far enough, it's a very long page, a lot of devices listed, but if you scroll far enough, you'll find uh, that email address on how to request uh, information on how to, to, get, to get the guidance on how to submit your IVD device for COVID-19. Perfect, that's definitely a good page uh, to bookmark. And maybe one more question here, Kathy, you were talking about that gap analysis. When is the perfect time? Is there a perfect time to start that gap analysis and performing those remediation activities? Yeah, right now. I mean, it's, <laughs> yesterday. It is, right? I mean, it is. it's the same. And it's the same process um, that we help clients with when they're taking an RUO device to IVD. It's the same sort of process. You know, you look at where you need to be and where you are and you know how you're gonna bridge the gap to get there. So yeah, you need, it's a good idea to get started now. Probably not the answer we wanted, but the uh, answer yeah. we needed. That's right. <laughs> all right, well, Kathy and Brad, thank you all so much uh, for your time today. If there's any questions uh, left, we'll follow up after the presentation, but uh, thank you both so much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, thanks everyone. Sure. Thanks for tuning right. in. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you at the next session. All right. Bye. Yeah. Okay, bye.